Begins in like five, four, three, two, one. Welcome to Wyatt, and I'm your host, Wyatt O'Brien Evans. Woof, goddammit, woof, woof, woof. Hey, my listeners, my listeners, my listeners, I've got one hell of a show today with a dynamo of an individual. Today's special guest is Mr. Brett A. Parson, former officer for the MPD, the Washington, D.C. Metropolitan Police Department. With more than 25 years experience in local, state, and federal law enforcement, Mr. Parson is an internationally recognized leader who has, who has helped create groundbreaking programs that are recognized as models for other departments across the country and around the globe. He's championed award-winning innovations in multiple areas, including programs to, to protect victims of domestic violence. I'm kicking off Domestic Violence and Awareness Month, which is October, with this installment of Wyatt. Intimate Partner Violence and Abuse, or IPVA, is domestic violence and abuse within the LGBTQ community. And I'm quite fortunate to have Brett here with us because he's such a valuable resource and authority on this dysfunctional, demoralizing, and potentially life-threatening cycle of behavior. And Brett will be pulling up to the mic post haste. And yo, after the show, visit my online home, WyattEvans.com. W Y A T T E V A N S.com. The go to a destination for LGBTQ news, features, commentary, and entertainment. And WyattEvans.com is visited by over 100 countries on the regular. We've got some great guest columnists. Who are they? They are um, R.L. Norman, uh, W.D. Foster Graham, uh, Hartzell Shirley. Their columns, y'all, are just, just, just on point. And at WyattEvans.com, you'll find my smoking hot, H-A-W-T hot, Nothing Can Tear Us Apart series of novels. The current installment is titled Frenzy! Yeah, Frenzy. And Frenzy is chock full of masculine romance, mystery, suspense, intrigue, danger, danger, y'all, and the blazing heat of a thousand suns of erotic passion and steaming nastiness. And y'all, good golly, Miss Molly, I'm hard at work, y'all, pinning the sequel to Frenzy. Yes, yes, it's called Delirium. Delirium. It ain't delirious. My prince is delirium. Y'all are going to get totally swept away. I mean, totally by the continuing passion and fire and exploits of Wes Antonio. More details to come. Oh, yeah. Uh, a program note. My sometimes part-time sidekick. Madam Pussy Galore, cock a doodle doo, drag queen supreme, will not be gracing us with an appearance. Thank God for that. Miss Thang will sashay herself in here, I guess, maybe next week. Who knows? Who knows? You know. Anyhow, let's jump into today's show. I have the distinct privilege of welcoming Mr. Brett A. Parson to Wyatt. And my listeners, my listeners, my listeners, 
I want to be just like this guy when I grow up. I mean, let me tell you this. Let me tell you something. I like the ocean. Like the ocean. His list of credentials and accomplishments stretch far and wide. And I ain't exaggerating one iota. As I stated at the top of the show, Brett's had a 25-year career in local, state, and federal law enforcement. During his tenure within the D.C. Metropolitan Police Department, he helped create groundbreaking programs that are recognized as models for other departments across the country and internationally. Most notably, he led the Gay and Lesbian Liaison Unit. The Gay and Lesbian Liaison Unit, the GLLU, which received the Harvard Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government Innovations and Government Award. That's one hell of an honor. Brett then assisted in expanding the Gay and Lesbian Liaison Unit to create the Special Liaison Branch, the, the SLB, whose mission is to improve police service to a wide range of underserved communities, including LGBTQ, African, Asian, Latino, deaf and hard of hearing, and the faith-based. However, battling intimate partner violence and abuse and domestic violence has become a specialty. And Brett regularly lectures at numerous leading educational institutions, y'all, including Harvard Law, Georgetown Law, and the University of Maryland, where he earned degrees in criminology and Spanish. And through his company, Brett A. Parson Consulting, the former officer provides service to a wide range of other organizations with diverse interests and missions. So without further ado, let's welcome Mr. Brett A. Parson. Talk at me. How the hell are ya? I am great, Wyatt. Thanks for that introduction. You know, when my mother wrote that, I don't think she ever expected somebody to read the entire thing. <laughs> you know, I did that because you deserve it. Seriously. Well, Seriously. thank you. It, it's it's very humble. It's hard to believe in in my short life um, that I've done all those things. I hear those and I realize, wow, yeah, actually I did that, didn't I? That was a long time ago. <laughs> well, Brett, listen, thanks so much for the sit down. And later in the show, we're going to have a robust discussion about intimate partner violence and abuse or IPVA. Um, let me say that I'm a survivor of IPVA. And as a journalist, one of my major foci is this horrific cycle of abuse. As an advocate and a speaker, I inform and educate about the cycle of violence and abuse and how you can make your great escape, a phrase that I've coined. So I am so glad to have you here. Really am. I'm honored to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Now, listen, I found this quote from the Washington Blade, which stated, Parson has been credited with playing a key role in improving police relations within the LGBTQ community since he was first named as supervisor of the then gay and lesbian liaison unit in 1999, end quote. What do you think of that? Well, I, you know, I, I would love to take credit for the progress we've made here in Washington, D.C. and around the country and even around the world. But the fact of the matter is, is I'm, I'm one small cog in a very large wheel. And there were a lot of people long before I started in this work who had worked very hard to make progress when they were in law enforcement and when they were working as community advocates and activists. Um, and, and all I did, quite honestly, Wyatt, and, and you'll hear this from lots of cops after their careers are over, is just did my job. Um, it was my role. I was asked by the chief of police to, to serve the, the community and to serve it to the best of my ability. I, I obviously um, personalized that so that it was something that I felt I could do and put my heart into. And I'm just proud that it was successful and that there are people that appreciated the work we did. But that work still continues. And there are many people that worked with me then and, and continue to work now who will 
improve upon the work that I did. So I, I, I don't take credit for it. I, I appreciate the kind words of my friends at the Washington Blade. Um, and to the extent that others agree with them, thank you to them for, for thinking that. Well, you're a gracious fella. Outstanding. Um, let's shoot the breeze a bit about being openly gay on the MPD, the Washington, D.C. Metropolitan Police Department. I mean, even in 2021, I would say that's a profile in courage. So, Brett, were you out upon your entry on the force or 25 years ago? Or if not, when did you come out and what prompted you to do so? Yeah, so, so let me set the stage just a little bit, Wyatt, because I think it's important to kind of understand the timeline here. I actually first raised my right hand to swear the oath of office in law enforcement in 1984, which is nearly 38 years ago. Now, while I wasn't wow. a police officer, I was a police explorer then. That's when I mm. entered this profession. So, you know, 38 going on 40 years ago. And at that time, there were no role models for me, um, LGBTQ plus people in law enforcement that I knew. Of course, back then, I also wasn't out to myself. So it wasn't really an issue, right? Looking back, I, I had a career before law enforcement um, that sort of was a detour. And that was professional athletics. I was a professional ice hockey referee. I refereed with the National Hockey League and came up through wow. the minor leagues. And in that realm, uh, I was extremely closeted. Um, I, I, there was nobody in that world that knew um, that I was living a second life behind the scenes. But when I applied in, in the late, um, I'm sorry, yeah, in the late 80s, early 90s, um, the irony was that that I applied openly because I felt like I just didn't want to hide myself anymore. I didn't want to have to do that anymore. And the departments that I applied to were large metropolitan police departments. They were, you know, NYPD, the Metropolitan Police Department, Washington, D.C., the L.A. County Sheriff's Department. Um, these were agencies that had reputations of being diverse organizations that had large LGBTQ plus populations that they served. And I really wasn't concerned that applying openly would be something that would be held against me. Now, look at me. <laughs> I'm, I'm six foot. At that time, I was 230 pounds. I'm a lot more than that. And I also have less hair, but something you can relate to, I bet. <laughs> yeah. But, but I, I didn't exactly exude vulnerability back then. Um, I was coming from a background of professional sports, ice hockey at that. Um, and so I think anyone who had any notion that they were going to be able to uh, harass me or somehow make me a victim. That was short lived because uh, I, I could dish it out as much as I could take it. Well, uh, uh, you are a big guy. So that is the, yeah, I get it. I get it. Okay. Thank you for that. I, I also oh. know, by the way, that that's not the experience of a lot of cops. You know, I, I right. have friends and colleagues um, who are gay and openly gay. And because of stereotypes, because of just biases that exist, both implicit and explicit biases, they've not enjoyed the type of, of welcoming atmosphere I've had in law enforcement. So I've had a bit of a fairy tale career, in my opinion. Cool. Okay, Brett, so that our listeners can get a fuller flavor of you, if you will, let's travel through the corridors of time. Are you ready? Let's do it. Okay, where were you born and raised? I'm a native Washingtonian right here in Washington, D.C., the nation's capital. What? In fact, I'm a third generation Is Washingtonian. That right. I am a native Washingtonian as well. And they say that most of Washingtonians are transplants. So it's really good to, to meet another native. Fantastic. All right. So what was your childhood like? Any trials, tribulations, interesting experiences that... um help make you into the individual that you are today? Well, I think probably most um, notable in, in my life is the experience of growing up um, in, in the suburbs of Washington. While I was born in Washington, D.C., my parents moved out of Washington, D.C. to the suburbs in Laurel, Maryland. And I was raised by a loving family, um, a, a very open and accepting family family. Um, my mother was in professional dance, and so the, the cultures and the arts were part of my upbringing. My father was a, a, a business owner. He was an entrepreneur, and so um, he was around a lot, and so he was my baseball coach and my soccer coach. 
So, so that provided quite a bit of stability and also quite a bit of leadership in my life. I also had an incredible education. One of the reasons why my parents moved out to the suburbs was because of the strength of the education system at that time in Prince George's County, Maryland, just outside of Washington, D.C. And I had some phenomenal teachers that, that to this day, I, I can look back and, and say, you know, my writing ability or my speaking ability or my ability to problem solve, I can attribute it to particular teachers who taught me lessons back, all the way back then, going all as far back as elementary school. And, and then finally, um, I've been extremely fortunate to, to be exposed to an incredible number of people from different religions, cultures, races, nationalities. Um, my, my best friends in the world aren't even from here in the United States. They're, they're from outside the United States. And so because of that, I, I think my perspective on humanity and uh, people is a little bit different than, than many of my peers in law enforcement. And then the last thing I will tell you is that um, I, I credit professional officiating, being a referee, to, to being um, really something that cr created the person that has the confidence and the skills to do what I've done throughout my entire career, which is sometimes make decisions that are really difficult, that are unpopular, um, but that are in the best interest of the, the population in general. And um, I, I really, being a high hockey referee really helped me do that starting at a very young age. Well, okay. I always like to ask my special guest the following question, which is this. What was Brett like as a little boy, a little nipper? What three characteristics or qualities would you say best described you? So I would say absolutely the first one was I was a sensitive kid. I, I was the kid that when um, my mother cried, I cried. I didn't know why, but, but I cried because mom was crying. Um, and I didn't Aww. like to see people in pain. Um, <laughs> seeing people suffer, seeing people who are unhappy, uh, I wanted to make them happy. And so that, that's probably one quality that I think I've had my entire life. Another is, um, and it probably explains why I became a hockey referee and then a cop. Um, I've never liked bullies and I've never liked injustice. Um, if I thought someone was being picked upon, if I thought something wasn't fair, that's when I would get in trouble. I would get in fights at school. I would talk back to teachers. I, I would be that person to push back. And, and I've always had that quality. And then the last is uh, I'm a passionate person. And, and in a good way, in a bad way, I'm a passionate person in that uh, if, if you're my friend, if you're someone I care about, uh, I'm going to hug you no matter what. You're going to have unconditional love from me. It also means that I, I've got an angry side and I, I, can, I can wear my emotions on my shirt sleeve and sometimes say things and do things that uh, other people don't feel is, uh, is appropriate sometimes. So I know that about myself. Well, you know, empathy is one of the most important qualities that makes a good cop. So I'm glad that you have that. All right, let us jet forward. You attended the University of Maryland, earning degrees in both criminology and Spanish. Actually, that's a strategic combination. Why did you choose? Well, I can understand criminology, but why the Spanish? So I grew up actually, despite being in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., many of my neighbors were Spanish speakers, and I grew up speaking to them. Mm -hmm. And I picked it up as a kid fairly easily. So it, it seemed like something that was natural. It also, um, I was raised in a household that valued learning a second language, and so that was important that, that I do that. Um, and, and also, at that time in our nation's history, we had a tremendous amount of immigrants coming to the United States who were Spanish speakers. And I just saw that as a, a really good combination for my degree in criminal justice, since I knew I wanted to be a police officer, to have those language skills and that, that background in the, the culture of Latino culture and Hispanic culture. I thought as much. Perfect. Okay. Well, what was the impetus behind you becoming a police officer? Well, that's was easy. Like Okay. <laughs> that that's Hit easy me. because because my story I don't think is is unique amongst many um particularly little boys. I I can't I can't relate to little girls. They may have had this feeling as well, but I went through like most little boys the year of, and I'll explain. So uh I guess I was probably six, seven years old, 
and I saw a police officer in uniform. And I was infatuated with the police officer in the uniform. It was my Halloween costume. Uh, it was my <laughs> birthday theme. It was all of my sheets and pillows and my wallpaper in my room had to become police officers. Uh, my mom couldn't get me to stop wearing my uniform to school, even though Halloween was months months past at that point. <laughs> and uh, there was this youthful enthusiasm and love for a profession and professionals that, quite frankly, I still have not grown out of to this day. I still have that youthful excitement of putting on the uniform and serving, of of being in charge. I think anybody who's a police officer that tells you that that part of the the lure for that job is not the power and ability to to take control of situations that are out of control, bring bring order to chaos, is something that I've always enjoyed. I've also enjoyed you know the the part of it being able to stop bullying, to be able to stop bad people from doing bad things, and to protect those people that are innocent, right? Um, and so that was always part of me as a kid. By the way, my mom to this day, I'm. 50, almost 54 years old, still calls my uniform my costume. Um, you know? <laughs> so I think any day now, she expects me to grow out of that Halloween costume. But <laughs> this, is, uh, this is something that just, I was fortunate enough to know at a very young age what I wanted to do. I got the education, the experience. I was mentored. I had some incredible role models. And gosh darn it, look at me. 38, almost 40 years later, I did it. They paid me good for a long, long time. And now they're paying me once a month to be retired from it. Listen, my man, you cannot beat that. Thank you for that explanation. And you know what? I can see it. I can see your love for the profession in your eyes right now because it's just, it's like an aura of glow just radiates, radiates all around you. That's so cool. Okay. Let's chat a bit about the two task forces that you put your stamp on, the Gay and Lesbian uh, Liaison Unit and the Special Liaison Branch, the SLB. Now, you were supervisor of the GLLU, then you headed the SLB. What's the mission for both of those task forces and why is there a need for both? Sure. Well, the mission is actually quite simple. It goes back to the word liaison. Liaison is that French word that means a connection or a bridge. And I viewed the liaison work we did originally between the LGBTQ plus community and then eventually to all those communities you mentioned um, as serving as a conduit, serving as a hand reaching out to other hands to bring that community closer, to provide them security, an avenue of communication, and to educate both them and the police officers that serve them on those communities. That's that's the basic mission, but there are three technical parts to the mission now of the special liaison branch. The first being um, community outreach, what you think about officer friendly, right? Going out to, to parades and community events and, you know, shaking hands and kissing babies and marching in parades with communities. It's really important, right? The second being training and education, training and educating police officers about these communities that are oftentimes not understood that have unique communications issues or unique issues in their history that make them not trusting of police, or there may even be a hatred of police, to be quite frankly. Um, and also training the community, teaching the community about law enforcement, about what their rights are, about what the expectations are of law enforcement, of them as citizens and of visitors to our city. And then finally, the most important part to me, this was the selfish part when I took over as the liaison supervisor, is a law enforcement aspect to this meaning policing and investigating, responding to incidents and crimes that occur in those communities so that we're just not viewed as the officer that shows up at the parade or the barbecue, but we also are there when trauma occurs. We're also there when an arrest needs to be made. We're also there to help you when you've been the victim of a crime or to ensure your rights are preserved when you're accused of a crime and make sure you're treated respectfully and with dignity. So those are the three parts of the mission, and, and I'm pretty proud that they continue today with the Metropolitan Police Department, and actually other departments around the world have, have kind of carried, carried out that model as well as they've developed. Okay, outstanding. Thank you, Brett, for that. Um, let's now turn to Intimate Partner Violence and Abuse, or IPVA, which is known as Domestic Violence and Abuse within the LGBTQ community. There are four crucial things that I refer to as tenets 
that we should always remember about IPVA. And after I list them, Brett, I'd appreciate you giving me your feedback. Okay, everybody. The first one is this. Anyone, and I do mean anyone, regardless of size, strength, age, sexual orientation, race, ethnicity, and or income, can become a victim of IPVA. Therefore, no one should be ashamed of being a victim. Number two, there are three basic types or components of IPVA. You've got the emotional, you have the mental, you've got the physical. Number three, regarding domestic violence between gay or SGL, same gender loving men, we have to dispel the myth that, you know, that boys will be boys mentality, that if it's just two guys, it's not IPVA because abuse is abuse. And number four, silence. Silence is the most potent the most powerful weapon in the abuser's arsenal. Therefore, in order for the victim to make his or her great escape, they got to tell someone, particularly someone they can trust. So what do you think about that? I couldn't agree more. Um, You know, I I teach eight hours and and 40-hour classes on this, Wyatt, and, and, and you've synthesized really kind of the the issue of intimate partner violence really well. Um, and just to speak to a couple of those things, Wyatt, if I could, mm-hmm. you know, when, you, when you were doing your introduction, you know, you thanked me for speaking on this topic um, and, you know, being public about it. I, I'm a firm believer, like you said, um, about, you know, having that silence is deadly, right? That light serves as a disinfectant and and that the more light we can shine upon this, it's, it's an epidemic, right, um, in, in all societies, that the more likely folks will be aware of it, recognize it, and move to intervene when they see it or become aware of it. Oftentimes, those, those of us who are in the middle of it, who are the survivors of intimate partner violence or are on the, t- are, are on the tangential you know, corners of it, we can't see that for us through the trees. And sometimes it takes an outsider to say, hey, listen, this isn't a healthy relationship. This isn't that. That's not right. You shouldn't be enduring that. Um, and you know, all of us can think about relationships that we've seen from the outside and thought, "Boy, that is not a marriage made in heaven." Or those, that's never going to last. But no one ever says anything to to the person who's enduring that pain. Um, those those types of of violence, if you will, you know, the emotional, the mental, uh, psychological, and then the physical violence. Most people don't realize because they just assume that there has to be physical violence, how absolutely draining and how sucking out the life of an individual can be to endure years and years of just mental abuse, of of just being in a tense relationship where every word you speak or every task you try to accomplish you wonder if this is going to be the time that they lash out at you and berate you or make you look, you know, look like a fool in front of your friends and family. So I couldn't agree with you more. It, it's been my work for nearly, nearly 40 years at this point. And I've done it because of exactly what you said. It doesn't discriminate. Um, the work that I've done in the LGBTQ plus community has been particularly gratifying because our community has been slow to acknowledge the amount of intimate partner violence that's occurring there. And unfortunately, police officers have never been trained how to deal with it. it. It's not much different than dealing with straight domestic violence, quite frankly, but there's kind of this pink haze that, that just sort of films or covers the investigation that sometimes can be uncomfortable for a police officer or just simply is outside the, um, uh, the officer's range of knowledge, right, of what questions to ask, what resources might be available, or even how a relationship like that works. And I've been working for a very long time to educate police officers in that way so that when they come across a a couple that isn't isn't part of the overwhelming majority of relationships, which are heterosexual relationships, right, Um, whether that be an intimate partner relationship where they're the same gender, whether it is one where they they are um, more um, amorphous in in their genders, right, um, 
pansexual people who, who have relationships with individuals regardless of their gender, that police officers know how to deal with those intricacies of those relationships and, more importantly, know what resources are available because, you know, let's face it, a gay man going into the usual domestic violence support group at a, at a local shelter, he's going to be surrounded by a bunch of women most of the time, right? And that's not going to work for him. By the way, the women aren't going to feel very comfortable either having him present there, even though he's a gay man. So you need to know that these things exist. And if they don't exist, where you can reach out to people to find them. Brett, let me say that everything you said is so on point and powerful. And I'm so glad you're here because you're bringing nuances and you're bringing, la and you're bringing layers. And I'm learning from you. And I appreciate that. Two things I want to say is that with COVID, it's even worse yeah. because of the, you know, the lockdowns, the sheltering in place, the lack of resources. And then number two, um, I experienced IPVA when I was in my 20s in my very first relationship. I was having problems dealing with sexual orientation, lack of self-esteem. I was very young. And with me, 90% of it, of the IPVA, was emotional and mental. And I tell people all the time that sometimes the emotional and mental scars are longer lasting and worse than the physical. And I will also say that if it weren't for a therapist, I wouldn't be the strong together person that I am today. And I'm a strong proponent of therapy because sometimes you just have to sit your ass on the couch with a professional who's got a degree in psychiatry, psychology, psychoanalysis to help you get through it. Does that make sense? Not only does it make sense, by the way, my, my, my master's work was in criminal justice and counseling. So um, Great. I, I, I'm a big proponent of, of psychology and ther the therapeutic method. Um, I, I have been in a relationship with a therapist since I started as a police officer, you know, 30 plus years ago. But, you know, the other thing about seeking therapy and, and talking to a professional is something that none of us want to think about, but hurt people hurt people. And none of us want to be that person that hurts another person. But when you're wounded psychologically or physically, the chances that you will then lash out and hurt someone else because of your pain, because of, because of something you're dealing with, increases greatly. And so if you just want to be a better partner yourself, not, not just dealing with your, your inner pain for yourself, but so that you can be a better partner to someone else or a better family member or a better neighbor or a better friend or coworker, Therapy helps that. Oh, man, absolutely. I mean, and we're not talking about, I mean, we're not talking about your minister unless your minister or your pastor has a, has a degree in psychology or psychiatry. You know, it's good to go to them, but you need a professional because I always tell people in workshops and seminars this. Let's say you broke your arm, right? You're not going to treat it yourself. You're going to the doctor. He or she will treat it, probably put it in a cast, maybe give you some pain meds because it's the same for the psyche. It doesn't mean to say that you're crazy. Maybe you are, though, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're crazy. It just means that you need a little help. Yeah, and the analogy I use is that uh, when your car breaks down, you don't take it to the local guy that fixes lawnmowers, right? <laughs> you know, just because he fixes things that are, have motors in them doesn't mean he's the right guy to go to. I like that analogy even better. Cool. Okay. Can you give us some of the major warning signs of intimate partner violence and abuse? What you have seen in your work? Sure. They, they almost always start with some warning signs. And those warning signs in a relationship start with just general tensions in a relationship that most people want to ignore. But, but they're not normal. It's not normal for there to be screaming matches, for there to be threats of leaving, for there to be threats of destruction of property, for there to be um, in, uh, implications that, that one is going to out you to, to your family. That's not normal. When, when someone starts using power and control over you in everyday arguments, that's a sign that this is going to eventually turn into something violent. 
it's just that way. And, you know, that's not to say that every relationship doesn't have its tensions, but in a healthy relationship, two people can yell and scream at each other and disagree and be angry at each other and not threaten each other and, and not, mm. not use power and control over each other to demean each other, the other person or to try and win. It, it's in a normal, healthy relationship. It's about airing one's grievances. It's about expressing your feelings. And then hopefully the other half hears that, acknowledges those feelings and expresses back their feelings. So, so that's number one. Number two, some of the very, very early warning signs is, you know, alcohol abuse, other drug abuse in a relationship increases the likelihood of intimate partner violence in any relationship. I'm not saying that just because your partner, you know, drinks that they're going to beat you. What I'm saying is that this is a variable that we see in a lot of intimate partner violence across the board. And then finally, mental health mental health issues, whether it's mm. depression, anxiety, um, being the survivor of intimate partner violence oneself. Unfortunately, the statistics tell us that if one was exposed to intimate partner violence in their life, unless they've gone and gotten treatment and talked to that professional that you, you recommended, that I recommended, the likelihood of them being that hurt person that hurts someone else increases. And so these are all red flags that I think people should look for. Um, and then finally, what I would say is something that, that may seem obvious to you and your listeners, but any form of violence is simply not acceptable. Mm -hmm. So, so if you have a partner that, you know, will grab you by the arm or slaps you occasionally or pushes you, okay, that's not normal. That, that's not just, oh, that's the way our people do that. Fill in the blank of whatever culture or religion or background you have. It's not acceptable. And, and it's a sign that this person uses physical violence to communicate. And that's dangerous. Very much so. Um, let's talk stigma, which I call the albatross around your neck that can choke the hell out of you. Um, males can be hesitant to report cases of abuse. Um, and label themselves as victims in order to maintain that manly image. So, you know, let's face it, no guy wants anyone to know that another guy has kicked his ass. So would you speak to the whole stigma point? Well, this is a huge barrier, particularly in, in same-gender intimate partner violence or what I would consider non-traditional intimate partner violence. Uh, make no mistakes, though, Wyatt. You know, women also suffer this stigma as well because you know it is a sign of weakness um, to to all people to admit that you've been the victim of something right but particularly in in the lgbtq plus community with gay men um this stigma this fear of being viewed even more weak by society by your friends by your family by your coworkers. i mean let's face it many of them are already struggling with because i'm gay i'm considered weak and now you add this layer of here I am in a relationship that's a gay relationship and I'm the victim in this relationship. And so it's, it's a double stigma. And so what we see is them enduring violence, them enduring unhealthy relationships for much, much longer than anyone should have to endure them and being afraid to reach out or even mention to anybody about what they're enduring for fear of being further stigmatized and judged as being weak. Hmm. Great points. Um, would you mind, Brett, defining the instigator and the aggressor and the parts they play in intimate partner violence and abuse? Man, I usually charge good money for this seminar, but I'll give it to you free, Wyatt, because I think it's, I think it's really important. I think it's really important for people to understand from a police perspective what these words mean. When, when we're talking about an instigator or a primary aggressor, we're talking about not investigating the event itself. Brett, Brett and Wyatt are boyfriends and the police are called and Brett slapped Wyatt. Okay. I was going to go with me pulling your hair, but that wouldn't be possible. Okay. <laughs> and, and the police get there. And, and in fact, there's a witness that says, yep, I saw that the, the white guy with the, the, the gray beard, he slapped the hell out of the black guy with the mustache. Um, and they were in a big argument. Well, that seems like an open and shut case. But in order to determine primary aggressor or instigator, 
we need to look into that relationship as a whole. Because if we don't know the context behind where that slap came from, what happened before that slap, okay? What was said? What was done? Why did the slap occur? We could, in fact, in this case, arrest me because I slapped you, Wyatt, right? But what if in this relationship, I am the perennial victim? I am the one who's been abused in this relationship. And what finally people saw was in public, me trying to stop the attack. Oh. Me trying to defend myself from something that was threatened. So, so when you're investigating primary aggressor, we're talking about doing a complete investigation into the facts and circumstances, not only of the event that you're looking at there, mm -hmm. but the relationship itself. And when we're talking about the instigator, not who necessarily threw the first blow, but who initiated the violence, who took this from being a regular, healthy argument between two people that care about each other and turning it into something that was criminal. And that could be, for instance, what if you took my cell phone right before I slapped you, Wyatt? And the reason why you took it is you thought I was cheating on you. That's theft. That's a controlling movement by you to seize my property and threaten that you're not going to give it back to me until you, I come clean that I'm cheating on you. And in an effort to get my property back from you, I slap you? Well, who's the aggressor there? Who started this domino? The, 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 the chain of dominoes falling. I think if you look at it a little bit differently with that context, you come to a different conclusion that maybe it wouldn't be me that got arrested. Maybe it would be you that is on the other end of the handcuffs, if you will, because of the history of the violence, the history of that, and the fact that you instigated this by taking property that didn't belong to you and by threatening me in a way that I was mentally abused. This can be a very complicated scenario. Yeah. It's like you've got to do this deep dive into, it's like turning it inside out, outside in to try to figure out exactly what happened, what role each person actually played. Yeah, and remember, we're not talking about social scientists here with PhDs and social workers and psychologists. We're talking about police officers. We're talking about men and women who've gone through a police academy six to nine months. They've received some training about how to interview people and the laws of arrest, search, and seizure, some self-defense courses. And then you're told, raise your right hand, go out there and protect and serve. So as human beings, sometimes we, we don't dig deeply enough. We don't ask the right questions. We, we miss things right in front of us that other people would look at and go, well, wait a second. Didn't you see this? Didn't you hear what they said? And you made this decision? Um, and and that's, that's a lot about current law enforcement right now is, is that, that frustration with we have human beings doing a job that has life and death consequences, literally, right? But also, we can take people's liberty away without anybody challenging us. You don't have a right as a person, as a citizen, to say, officer, I think you're wrong. That's what court's for, right? That's what you get an attorney for. But at the moment I make that decision, I have an incredible amount of power. And sometimes I think we forget that the people that are exercising that authority and have that power are just human beings, just like you and me. That can be kind of scary. And it's also very sobering as well. Um, Brett, do you believe that, do you believe that the abuser can control his or her behavior? That's a great question, because, because I think the answer is it depends. Um, do I think there are people who are suffering from mental health issues, uh, who some of them are psychotic and don't know the difference between right and wrong, or people who are just hurt people who are hurting people, right? They have not gotten the type of help that they need, and so they continue to engage in behaviors that are assaultive, that are abusive. Absolutely. And to that extent, I don't know that they have a choice right? But that's why the systems we have in place exist, because what we know from research is there has to be an intervention. That when someone, if someone steps in and separates the parties and says, nope, time out for you, right? You need to go to bed, the little bad boy cell for 24 hours, and then the prosecutor's going to make a decision on whether or not we prosecute. That if, if that decision is left in the hands of the survivor, that oftentimes they're not going to make a rational decision. 
Oftentimes they're going to make a decision just based upon, okay, I'm safe now at this moment. Please don't do this because it could get worse. And, and so back to your question of, do I think they have the ability to, to not be abusive? Yes. But what do you do about an alcoholic, right? Who, who physically or mentally can't stop drinking. And mm. when he or she is drinking, they're violent drunks. Can they stop that without, without some help? No, I, I'm not justifying their behavior. I hope you hear that. I'm not saying that, you know, alcoholics sure, get sure. a free pass and they get to beat their spouses. What I'm saying I is, I don't know if it's as easy as saying, well, they can just stop drinking or they can just, just don't, don't be physically abusive. There are a lot of things going on in people's lives and in people's minds that they're not in control of. And, and that's why there's an entire profession to help people break those cycles. Okay. Okay. Um, can you provide our audience, our listeners with tips on how victims can extricate themselves from the violence and abuse so they can make their great escape? Yeah. What? Yeah. A a absolutely. Why? So the first thing I would tell you is um, identify a safe place or a safe person. Go there and start talking. Mm. Um, set up a plan. Um, the, the last time, the, the, the last thing you want to be doing is being making the decision of survival in the middle of a crisis. And so the time to be thinking about extricating yourself from an abusive relationship is when things are going well, when, when you can wander freely about the cabin, right? That the, 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 the fastened seatbelt light is not on and that exactly. you can talk to people openly and honestly and have no mm -hmm. fear that violence is afoot. And the second is to take advantage of the resources that are available to you. So many times because of our internalized homophobia or, or our, our pride or just our lack of self-esteem, when someone reaches out and says, can I give you a ride? Can I drop you off someplace? No, no, I'm good. I'll walk. Well, damn it, it's 95 degrees out. You have two bags and you don't know where you're going to be sleeping tonight. Right. Take the damn ride. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Um, and, and that's easier said than done because we've all done it. I mean, hell, you've probably been in public sometime, Wyatt, and, you know, you know cut your finger or, or bumped your head and somebody said, hey, you know, can I help you there? And you're, no, no, I'm good. I'm good. Right. But the fact yeah. is you weren't good. You know, your head was throbbing or you, you couldn't stop the bleeding and you needed a, another paper towel, but you just weren't going to ask anybody else. Whether it's intimate partner violence or something a lot less extreme, I think we all have that. And so, so that's the second thing I would say is accept help when it's offered. Don't say no, say yes. It's not easy to say yes, but you have to do it. And again, Brett, silence is the most powerful, the most potent weapon in the abuser's arsenal. Yep. You got to got to talk. You got to talk. OK, uh, I want to touch on separation assault, which can occur after the victim has left the abuser. And sometimes that can be the most dangerous period in the whole situation. So would you comment on that for us, please? Well, I'm going to be even more emphatic about this. The research tells us why up there, there's no more potentially dangerous time period for a victim of an abusive relationship than the moment of separation. Um, that, that the most lethal events, um, lethality is most common at the time that the cycle of violence is broken and that the abuser feels that they have lost complete control of the situation. So, uh, so it, it is more serious to me than you even introduced it to be. Mm -hmm. um, and that is why in times of peace, you want to have an escape plan in, in place. And that escape plan should include, you know, who am I going to call? Where am I going to go? You know, how am I going to eat? How, where am I going to sleep? Um, and are there other people who can be my eyes and ears for me? Because the more people, it's, it's that silence thing, right? The more people that know that you have left and that there is a potential, this is a potentially dangerous time for you. That's other people that can give you a he heads up and say, Hey, Hey, Wyatt, the other day I saw Brett drive by work twice. He didn't do anything. He didn't stop, but he just drove by. 
And if I didn't tell you that, would you know that, that, that he's now probing your security at work, right? Mm. So the more people that know, the better. I know it's embarrassing. I know it's, it's, a, it's a shot to our self-esteem and our independence. But you have to have those allies looking out for you. Mm. Great. Um, tell us about Brett A. Parson Consulting. Give us the full Monty, my friend. I'm, I'm really fortunate, Monty. Uh, Monty, you said full Monty. I just called you Monty. Uh, <laughs> the full Wyatt. <laughs> I'll give you the there full you Wyatt. I, I'm really fortunate. So, you know, here I've had this career in law enforcement nearly 40 years as, as an explorer and as a cop. And throughout that, I, I have been teaching and consulting and, and speaking on law enforcement issues all over the place. Um, for some reason, there are people that think I, I, I'm good at it, or at least they want to hear what I have to say. And I knew what I wanted to do in retirement. Well, first of all, I knew I wanted to retire when those opportunities began to outnumber my opportunities at my police job. So when my police job started to get in the way of traveling to cool places and speaking to groups all over the world, that's when I knew it was time to start thinking about transitioning from full-time policing, part-time consulting, speaking, and, and educating, to then being a full-time consultant, educator, and speaker, and a part-time police officer. And so I did that, and I, I offer a range of services, but really, if I were going to just summarize what I do, I help police departments, communities, governments, non-government organizations deal with all of the issues going on in contemporary policing and the relationships we have with policing in our communities. And I tailor those for every community. And I'll just give you one example. Um, while I can't identify the jurisdiction, I was contacted by a jurisdiction here in the United States, a, a, a mid-sized city, um, mm -hmm. in, in, I'll even say in New England. And I was contacted by their, their director of diversity and inclusion that works for their town. And she was beside herself because they were having a really hard time because the police department was hated. Um, and they've tried town hall wow. meetings. There was one particular officer that was uh, deemed to be a racist and had posted some racist comments. The mm -hmm. police department started, chose to fire him, but had to hire him back because of union rules. Mm -hmm. And so because of all this, every effort they had meet, made to bring community members who were rightfully outraged by this Together with the police chief and police officers, they turned into scream fests. I was brought in um, to run a town hall style me meeting and to discuss a very just specific topic of how symbols are viewed differently by individuals. Mm. So take something like, let's, let's just go with the thin blue line, for, the thin blue line, right? I, as a police officer of nearly 40 years, have a very specific view of what the thin blue line means to me. I'm the president. In fact, I'm wearing my shirt right now. I'm the president of Concerns of Police Survivors, which takes care of the family members and survivors of officers killed in the line of duty. The thin blue line means to me that sacrifice, that courage, the death of a police officer in the line of duty. It's, it's deeply held for me. I have 13 peers on the law enforcement memorial wall, and I've been present for four of my coworkers' deaths in the line of duty. However, let's, let's just take you as an example. Mm -hmm. You grew up in a different place at a different time. And let's face it, look at the picture, folks. We're a different race. And your view of that thin blue line may be that you've heard and seen people waving that flag or standing behind that thin blue line. And they represent racism. They represent power of a group that is not under, under control who is oppressing particular groups of people, whether they be un, uh, economically, racially, religiously. And so when you see that flag, you see a very different symbol. And you don't want to see that flying at the police department, do you? Because what it means to you is something very different than what it means to me. Mm -hmm. So we had a discussion about that. We had a discussion about the swastika. We had a discussion about Pepe Le Pew. Google that, uh, listeners. You know, Pepe Le Pew, a cartoon character that I believe started in the 40s and the 50s, very innocently. Exactly. Is now a symbol of misogyny and sexual yep. abuse and harassment. It's just a cartoon character. It was a skunk, a cute skunk that, you know, but it has a very different meaning today as people look back at that. We can get into Dr. Seuss and some of the images that, that he portrayed in his books. 
Does it change that he was a brilliant educator and writer and, you know, has helped ch- millions of children around the world, you know, learn the gift of reading? No. Does it mean that he was a creature of his time and some of those images looking back were not appropriate at all, or if they were appropriate then, they certainly aren't appropriate now? Those are the conversations that I help. I help them with developing liaison units. I help them with developing criminal ju- or, um, intimate partner violence programs um, and how to train officers to do a better job on those scenes and on and on and on. It's a long answer to a short question. Well, it was a necessary answer, and you are very, very good at what you do. Oh, thank you. (laughs) So what do you have on tap for the rest of uh, 2021? What projects, et cetera, et cetera? Really exciting. Um, I'm really proud to be affiliated with some just some amazing organizations. And God, I hope I don't leave any of these out. But but in no particular order, uh, I, I am... These are all, I'm an independent contractor, a consultant with them working in some capacity. I'm working with the Georgetown University Law Center, you know, an internationally recognized law school here in Washington, D.C., has produced Supreme Court justices out of their law school in in something called the Innovative Policing Program, Active Bystandership for Law Enforcement. And what I am as a lead training instructor, I've trained, helped train over a thousand police officers to go back to their agencies in 38 different states and to teach them how to intervene when another police officer is causing harm. I want you to imagine for a second, Wyatt, if those three police officers in Minneapolis had been trained how to intervene, could they have stopped Derek Chauvin before he killed George Floyd? Yeah. There are lots of reasons, scientific reasons, why they didn't. And we know that training can overcome that. And so this program does that. So I'm really proud to be involved in that. I work with the Matthew Shepard Foundation traveling around the nation, training police officers, detectives, and police officers how to respond to and investigate hate crimes. And then I work on training prosecutors on how to prosecute those hate crimes. Um, I'm working with the Anti-Defamation League, which is one of the preeminent civil rights organizations in the country, training police officers on what violent extremism looks like, what leadership looks like in law enforcement in the 21st century, and also talking to them about hate crimes and how to investigate hate crimes. And then finally, I'm working with a group, and like I said, I'm, I'm gonna leave some of them out, but um, a group called Out to Protect, which is a nonprofit organization based out West. And it's an organization that was formed to provide a central place where LGBTQ plus cops can go to find like-minded cops who are also LGBTQ plus, who many of them are become their liaisons, either officially or unofficially in their agencies, resources for them, training for them, and support for them. And so I'm on their advisory board, and I also serve as the primary um, teacher on the webinars that we hold every two or three months. So those are just an example of some of the projects. I'm going to be leaving for Israel here in the, in the next uh, two months. Hopefully, if COVID relents for us, uh, I'm still the president of the Concerns of Police Survivors chapter here in Washington, D.C., and also of the Jewish Police Association called the Shomrim Society. So I'll be going representing those two organizations in Israel for about 14 days at the end of October. And then I still have a family. (laughs) Okay, give us the secret. How do you fit all of this into your schedule? You must have some mad, crazy time management skills. I mean, how, how do you do it? Well, one thing you learn as a police officer that sleep is overrated. Oh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. And, and multitasking is something that I've also learned how to do. And so, you know, for instance, I've written an entire book during the time we've been together now. I'll be publishing that later. Um, I was able to do that just while I was talking to you. So that was my left hand and my right hand was just going through my notes talking to you. Uh, but in all seriousness, um, that goes to back to part of the upbringing that we talked about early in the interview. You know, when you asked about, you know, kind of who is Brett Parson and where did he come from? Mm-hmm. I, I came from a family that just wasn't sedentary. Um, my mom and dad, uh, I can remember on mornings where, you know, there would be snow uh, here in Washington and my mom and dad would be up at 435 in the morning listening to the radio. And as soon as they would announce Prince George's County schools are closed, they would wake my sister and I up, get our asses out of bed. Come on, we're going skiing. Come on, we're ah, going downtown. Ah, you know, I love we'll it. Do this. And, and so we quickly learned that, you know, What's the saying? The idle hands are the devil's wor- uh, workshop, mm. right? We learned that if you're not doing something, then you're doing nothing. Well, that's the answer to my question. Great. Uh, 
Well, how do us grown folk connect with you, contact you? Give us all of your social media, if you would. Well, thank you. I don't have a website. I'm I'm a little uh, little behind the times in that, but I can be found on Facebook at Brett Allen Parson, and you'll see my ugly mug there um, on my my profile photo, so it's easy to know that it's me. I'm also located on LinkedIn, the same name, Brett Parson. Happy to communicate there. And then I'm happy to share my email address publicly with anybody that wants to get in touch with me. And it's simply Brett, B-R-E-T-T dot Parson, P-A-R-S-O-N, at gmail.com. And I return emails within the first 24 to 48 hours. And I'm happy to consult with anybody, chat with anybody, and try and help in any way I can. But one of the great things about retirement is, unlike when I was a police officer, that I had to answer every call that came to me, I get to pick and choose my projects now. And so I'm, I'm trying to focus on the projects that I feel most passionately about and that I feel that I can bring the most to. Awesome. Oh, before I forget, I wanted to, I want to send a shout out to Mike Silverstein, our mutual buddy who connected us. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Mike. So listen, Mr. Brett A. Parson, thank you for, shop, for stopping by Wyatt. I really appreciate it. You've got to come back. Wyatt, this was this was such a pleasure, and I hope to come back. And if I could take a personal liberty here um, to, one, wish anyone who's observing it, L'Shana Tova, Happy Jewish New Year to those that observe. And also, I think, you know, we can't forget today, September 11th, is the 20th anniversary of the attacks on our, our country on 9-11-2001. And there are a lot of people still wounded out there, a lot of people still grieving, even 20 years later. I just wanted to recognize that. We'll never forget. All the best to you. Take care. So there you have it. You can find the official Wyatt podcast page on WyattEvans.com. The official hashtag is Wyatt on air. If you want to be a guest on Wyatt, or you just have feedback, comments, email me at WyattOnAir at gmail.com. You can follow me, Wyatt O'Brien Evans, your host, on Facebook.com slash Wyatt O'Brien Evans. On Twitter, at Mr. Woe, M-I-S-T-E-R-W-O-E. On Instagram, at Mr. Wyatt O, M-R-W-Y-A-T-T-O. And be sure to check out my Nothing Can Tears Apart series of novels. The latest being Frenzy. I said Frenzy. And its predecessor, Rage. All at WyattEvans.com. Now, on a serious note before I close out, if you or someone you know is experiencing intimate partner violence and abuse or domestic violence and abuse call the National Domestic Violence Hotline the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 800-799-7233 800-799-7233 or call the Gay Men's Domestic Violence Project Hotline the Gay Men's Domestic Violence Project Hotline, 800-832-1901. 800-832-1901. And then there's the Trans Lifeline Hotline. The Trans Lifeline Hotline. It is new. It's a peer support phone service run by trans individuals. Again, the first of its kind. Two numbers. The U.S. phone number is 877-565-8860. The U.S. phone is 877-565-8860. In Canada, the number 877-330-6366. Canada, 877-330-6366. And my online home, WyattEvans.com, has a special IPVA section with resources. So make sure you check that out. So listen, everybody. Until next time, be good to yourselves. 
and be good to each other. And I'll be right back at you.